Carissimi, fuggite il mondo e lasciate il peccato. Rendete l'altrui se voi volete schifare l'inferno. From when such presumption, son of Bernardone, you vile little man, to order brother Rufinus, one of Assisi's most noble men, to go around preaching to the people like a madman. By God, you shall experience for yourself what you have commanded others to do. Ho vissuto l'umiltà di Francesco e vi assicuro che sarà da scudo per le nostre anime. Quando entrammo tutta la gente, uomini e donne, rise e ci schernì. Francesco non si curò di tanta agitazione e con le sole brache salì fino al fianco di Rufino e cominciò a predicare così meravigliosamente le volontà di nostro Signore Gesù che tutta la gente si commosse e quelle mani che prima si agitavano minacciose verso di noi ora asciugavano le lacrime dai propri volti e poi con devozione ci accarezzarono. È stato in quel momento che il nostro Signore ha segnato la mia volontà. Ecco, cari fratelli, come io feci i primi passi con Francesco. Anche voi affronterete simili prove. Abbiate completa fiducia in Lui, perché Egli è mosso dal Signore. Venite, fratelli, andiamo. We are at Portiuncola, the place where Francis had the inspiration to cease living the eremitic life and instead to live in a community of brothers. From here, Francis departed for Rome to see Pope Innocent III and obtain approval for the earlier rule. When he returns, Francis will continue to welcome brothers here into the order, including Brother Leo. Leo was born in Assisi at the end of the 12th century though other sources place his origins near Viterbo. He was a cultured man, a priest, and a skilled calligrapher. Leo entered the order between 1210 and 1212, after the rule was approved by Pope Innocent III. Devoted to evangelization and prayer, he was one of the followers of the second hour. Yet that did not keep him from becoming one of Francis's favorite and most loved companions. Francis even wanted him as his inseparable confessor and secretary, so much so that he played an important role since the start of many events at Francis's side. Thanks to his purity and simplicity, Leo was called by the saint, God's little lamb. Francis was inspired by God to depart from Val di Spoleto and go to Romagna with Brother Leo. During their journey, they went past Montefeltro Castle, where a great banquet and parade were being held for the new cavalry. St. Francis, hearing of this festival, said unto Friar Leo, let us go up thither unto this feast, since by God's help we shall gather some good spiritual fruit. Now, among the gentlemen present, there was an important and wealthy gentleman from Tuscany, whose name was Sir Orlando of Chiusi in Casentino. He had heard of Francis's holiness and bore him great devotion and had very great desire to see him and to hear him preach. Francis shows by his example in a historical age of antagonism, conflicts and holy wars, that dialogue between persons is possible that peace among men is possible, even when they are divided by ethnic, cultural, and religious differences, or by a war being waged. Francis becomes, therefore, a man of reconciliation. Having arrived at the castle, Francis entered the public square, where the multitude of those gentlemen was assembled. With fervor of spirit, he climbed upon a little wall and began to preach taking as the text of his sermon these words in the vernacular. So great is the bliss I hope to see, that every pain delighteth me. And from this text he preached so devoutly that every man stood with eyes and mind fixed upon him, a 
and listened to him as if an angel of God was speaking. Among them was Sir Orlando, being touched in the heart by God through the marvelous preaching of St. Francis. Many of St. Francis's sermons were done through gestures, writes Thomas of Celano, Francis's first biographer. When he spoke, he was all mouth. His communication was immediate. Beyond that, I would not know how to explain the fascination exerted by this man. One of St. Francis's companions, Brother Maceo, a commoner, handsome, a good speaker, once asked him, why does the whole world follow you, wanting to see you and obey you? This is a recurring question. No one can understand how this man drew people to himself in admiration. Even men and women from outside the Christian faith. Pace bene, pace bene. Che il Signore benedica questa tavola. Un pezzo di pane. Il Signore ti benedica. Francesco, ho una donazione per voi. Siete gentile, ma non abbiamo bisogno di denari. Datelo ai poveri e il Signore ve ne sarà grato. Non parlo di denari. Possiedo un monte chiamato Laverna e per il sollievo della mia anima vorrei che divenisse la dimora della vostra preghiera e della vostra solitudine. Portatemi da Francesco. Venite. Francesco sarà lieto di udire le vostre parole. For Francis, life in the Hermitage is an experience of God, an experience of living the Gospel in a new way, compared to what hermits might ordinarily experience. Francis had seen in the episode at Bethany, where Martha and Mary welcomed the Lord into their home, the way of expressing the eremitic life that is closest to the Gospel. Let those who wish to live the religious life in a hermitage, be they three brothers or four at the most, let two of these be mothers and have two sons or at least one. Let the two who are mothers keep the life of Martha and the two sons the life of Mary. Living the role of the mother and the role of the son in communion, in fraternity, does nothing other than to help us live the mystery of the Blessed Mother and of the Son of God in the close relationship that binds them. And therefore, in practice, it helps us live the mystery of the Gospel. Starting from 1216, the Order's progress is marked by general chapters, during which all the friars twice a year, on the day of Pentecost and the day of the Feast of St. Michael, gather at the Portiuncola. During the chapters, they discussed how to apply the rule. They recounted their experiences returning from the missions, the new languages and new cultures, in addition to the many difficulties of their first journeys, such as mistrust, derision and ill treatment, sometimes even to the point of martyrdom. Francis's time was a time of jesters and a time of storytellers, a time of tales involving heroes, great and small, who walked this earth and were the only famous people apart from the powerful men of history. But Francis was not a powerful man, and Francis's stories were not likely to be told by jesters or storytellers. Until in 1219, he decided to depart on a crusade with Brother Illuminato. Once they arrived at the Sultan's court, he managed to speak with the Sultan, and even more incredibly, he lived to tell about it. He who spoke with the enemy of that age. News of this event would spread throughout known Europe, making Francis extremely famous. In the chapter of 1220, Francis renounced his role of governing the order and appointed as vicar Pietro Cattani, who would die the following year, 
as can be read on his tombstone on the outer wall of the Porciuncola. The order founded by Francis had grown greatly, and at the general chapter of 1221, called the Chapter of Mats, more than 5,000 brothers arrived at the Porciuncola. During that chapter, Brother Elias was elected as the new vicar. This meeting would become very important for the history of the brothers because it would sanction what was gradually taking place, that is, the passage of Francis's charism to the community, a necessary step without which we would not be here today. Francis had this great intuition to not keep for himself the inspiration that came from God, but to pass it on to a community. Andate in pace, fratelli miei. If we take only the first companions, the first 11, 12, with St. Francis, and examine their lives, we find a nobleman side by side with a farmer, a man of the cloth next to a commoner. That is, in medieval times, these individuals could not form a community. They could not even dress like the others, but had to dress according to their social position. So we have to ask, how did St. Francis manage to break down these divisions? And to turn these men who came from the feudal world as masters and servants into brothers, that is, brothers among themselves. Non essere inquieto. Il tuo animo deve essere leggero. Non ci riesco. Alcuni nostri fratelli sembra che non mi riconoscano più. Altri si raccomandano di controllare le stranezze di Francesco. Ma quali stranezze? Tutti noi siamo qui con queste vesti per volere di nostro Signore. Quali sono ancora le loro paure? Perché temono così tanto il volere di Francesco? Leone, io credo che loro temano se stessi. Tutti noi ci sentiamo così piccoli di fronte all'esempio di Frate Francesco. Dobbiamo avere più fiducia in noi stessi e lasciarci guidare da lui. La regola sarà il giusto cammino per la nuova vita. Leone caro, la tua fede ha una grande luce. La tua sensibilità è la dimora ideale per le parole di Francesco. Rufino, Angelo, Stringetemi a voi. Pregheremo per voi. Pace e bene, Leone. Pace e bene, fratelli miei. During these years, people from different social classes and cities joined the order, as a result of which, in 1223, Francis decided to write a new rule. And with Brother Leo and Brother Boniface from Bologna, he withdrew to the hermitage of Fonte Colombo. When speaking of the rule of St. Francis, we must always keep in mind that it is not only St. Francis's rule. St. Francis and his fellow brothers created the rule and corrected it. While the Benedictine rule provides for stabilitas loci, that is, that the monk joins an abbey, is the son of that abbey, and is bound to stability, instead, the Franciscan rule is a moving rule. At the beginning, there were not even convents. The convents were called places, because life was itinerant. St. Francis wanted to combine contemplative life with apostolic life. In the approved rule, we have these beautiful words. When the brothers will travel throughout the world, it is clear that problems will arise. Where should a sick brother go traveling throughout the world? Traveling throughout the world, always barefoot, even in impracticable areas. 
then problems do not mean disagreement, but evangelical realism. Come vicario, ho sentito il dovere di venire qui. In tanti ritengono che la regola sarà dura e aspra. Perché esasperarsi nel tormento? Si può predicare la parola di Cristo, anche senza troppi padimenti. Comprendo i vostri timori. Ma lasciamo che sia l'amore per Francesco a portarci dove vuole il Signore. Non saremmo qui se non amassimo Francesco. Il mio spirito è con lui. Riferirò agli altri fratelli il suo messaggio. Pace e bene, frate Leone. Pace e bene, frate Elia. Che il Signore sia con voi. E abbi cura di Francesco. Francis went off then according to the revelation he had received from the Lord and withdrew to the hermitage in Fonte Colombo in a cell that was in a hollow of the rock underneath that place. Only two brothers were allowed to visit him, Brother Leo and Brother Boniface. There by a revelation from Christ he wrote the rule, putting into it nothing of his own. He wrote only those things that Jesus Christ revealed to him from heaven. The rule and the life of the friar's minor is this to observe the holy gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ by living in obedience, without possessing anything and in chastity. Having completed the rule, Francis, according to a command received from Christ, went together with Brother Leo to the Supreme Pontiff, Honorius III, who especially loved the blessed Francis, having great reverence for him. The Pontiff took the rule and observed it, after having studied it at length and pondered it well, he approved it definitively on November the 29th, 1223. The original parchment of the papal letter with the text of the rule and the papal bull is now kept in the chapel of the Holy Convent of Assisi in the lower church. One day at St. Mary's, Blessed Francis called Brother Leo and said, Brother Leo, write what true joy is. The story of perfect joy, this short passage, essentially refers us to the story of two people, Francis and Leo. Francis begins the first part of the tale. He lists a series of beautiful events, all regarding the order and himself. Dear Leo, write this. This is not perfect joy. Leo is confused and asks, well, what then is perfect joy? And the well-known second part begins. I return alone from Perugia to Porziuncola on a cold and muddy night, hungry. I arrive and they do not open the doors for me. They even tell me, we no longer need you. Go away. Ask there at the hospital of the Crocifori, where they house the last ones of society, the unfortunate, the lepers. I say to you that if I keep my patience and do not become disturbed, in this consists true joy as well as true virtue and the salvation of my soul. I think that that story, Brother Leo, write me where perfect joy is found, was a sort of logic that was given to him, which he shared with Francis and which never left him. Leo, who follows Francis and attempts to live out that project of Christian life suggested to him by Francis, asks himself the question that I think dwells in all who seek to take the rule of the gospel seriously. Is there a special way of living that must be the same for everyone, or should I stay as I am? The Cathedral of Spoleto keeps, among some of the most valuable relics, the letter that St. Francis wrote to Brother Leo. Brother Leo, your brother Francis wishes you health and peace. And so I say to you, my son, as a mother, that everything we have said along the way, I summarize briefly in this word of advice. And afterwards, there is no need for you to come to me for advice, because I advise you thus, in whatever way it seems best to you to please the Lord God and to follow in his footsteps and poverty, do it with the blessing of the Lord God and with my obedience. 
And if it is necessary for you, so that you may be further consoled, that your soul comes back to me. And if you want to, come. Francis answers that everyone has their place in God's plan. And everyone answers the call according to their abilities, according to their natural gifts, and, I would say, also according to their tastes. Each one of us has their story, and this story is written day after day, in listening to the word of God, and in the answer that each one is capable of giving. This also underlines, I think, the respect that Francis had for others. He did not want all his friars to do exactly what he did, in the way that he did it. But gathering people from different walks of life, with different cultures and different sensitivities, he joined them under a single intention, which is that of following the Lord, without denying their unique gifts and personalities. So to Leo, who asks himself what he must do, Francis basically says to him, be yourself. And inasmuch as you are fully yourself, you will be a disciple, because you will carry out God's will for you. St. Francis always loved walking along border areas, because borders divide or unite. He was always a builder of bridges. And at that point, he understood that a psychological dependence was developing between himself and Brother Leo, which he did not tolerate. But very patiently, he said to Leo, all those things that we had already spoken of along the way, there I have said it. There is no need for you to come to me. But if you really want to, come, Brother Leo. This is the last word, come. St. Francis was a house without doors or windows. Everyone could come and go. On Christmas Eve, 1223, St. Francis, together with Leo and some other companions, decided to celebrate near the village of Grecio, the nativity of the infant Jesus thus giving life to the first nativity scene in history. He had them set up a manger, asked them to bring some straw, an ox, and a donkey. The friars were called and the local residents rushed over. The man of God stood before the manger, filled with piety, bathed in tears, overflowing with joy. Francis preached to the people and spoke of the birth of the poor king, and in naming him, out of the tenderness of his love, he called him the child of Bethlehem. In the month of August, 1224, Brother Leo, Brother Massio, and Brother Angelo were at Francis' side on the hillside of La Berna to observe the Lent of St. Michael the Archangel, which began on the Feast of the Assumption. Go ye to your own place and leave me here alone, for with the help of God, I mean to keep this fast in this place, without any distractions, and let none of you come nigh me, nor suffer any layman to come to me. But thou, Friar Leo, alone shalt come unto me once a day with a little bread and water, and at night once again at the hour of the matins. And then thou shalt come unto me in silence, and thou shalt say unto me, Lord, open my lips. And if I answer thee, come by the cell, and we will recite the matins together. But if I answer thee not, get thee gone immediately. We find Francis here at La Verna, and he is in the company of Brother Leo, his friend and confidant. Leo cares for Francis in his needs. He makes sure that he lacks nothing. But Leo is also going through a difficult time of spiritual dryness. And in friendship, there is also reciprocity. Francis realizes this. He becomes aware of Leo's need. Domine, labia mea aperes. Perché non mi hai voluto con te? Francis begins to contemplate very devoutly Christ's passion and his infinite charity. And so much did his devotion grow that everything he did became Christ-like through his love and compassion. The gift of the stigmata on a night right before the Feast of the Exaltation of the Cross on September the 14th. There appeared to him a winged seraphim resembling the crucifix who imprinted upon his body the signs of the passion. The stigmata are the signs of the passion of Christ 
in his hands, his feet, and his chest. The biographers do not speak of wounds or of holes, but of nails made of hardened flesh that passed through Francis's limbs. And, albeit these most holy wounds, being imprinted by Christ, gave very great joy to his heart, nevertheless, to his flesh and to his corporal senses, they gave intolerable pain. Wherefore, being compelled by necessity, he chose Friar Leo, the simpler and purer among the others, and to him he revealed everything, permitting him to see and to touch those sacred wounds and to bind them up with some cloths in order to alleviate the pain and soak up the blood which issued and flowed from those wounds. Francis, the angelic man, came down from the mountain, bringing with him the effigy of the crucifix, depicted not on stone tablets or on hand-carved wooden panels, but engraved on parts of his flesh by the finger of the living God. And because it is a good thing to hide the king's secret, he, aware of the royal secret, hid those sacred signs as best as possible. St. Francis loved Brother Leo because of his two special virtues, his simplicity and his purity of heart. He asked St. Francis for something written by him personally, immediately after the event of the stigmata at the Verna. Thanks to this request, we have one of the two handwritten texts from St. Francis. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he show his face to you and be merciful to you. May he turn his face to you and give you peace. May the Lord bless you, Brother Leo. On the cartula, or little letter, on the side opposite the blessing, there is another composition by Francis, the praises of God Most High. A prayer where the word you is continually repeated, referring to God. A prayer that originates after the experience of the stigmata, after this gift, and seems to express Francis's experience in terms of an I, Francis's I, that loses and abandons itself in the you of God. In this writing, St. Francis has left a relic ex corde, a piece of his heart, and something more. He has combined the prayer to the God Most High, the praises of God Most High, as they are called, with real charity, while he had experienced one of the highest mystical phenomena, indeed the highest, because we are talking about the first stigmata in history. Next to him, a priest, Brother Leo, kept this card for his entire life. Upon his death, this card was found folded in four and sewn into the tunic of Brother Leo. But there is also Brother Leo's handwriting. No other companion of Francis received such a double gift as Brother Leo did. This should be enough to explain the fraternal bond between the two. Il Beato Francesco scrisse di sua mano questa benedizione a me, frate Leone. Nello stesso modo fece questo segno del Tau con testa d'uomo, di sua mano. Between the second and third section, the cartola bears a drawing of a large cross in the form of a towel planted on a roughly drawn mountain, on which one sees a bearded face, the head wrapped in a cloth. It is the cross of Christ planted on Adam's tomb, representing the redemption of all mankind. The Tau cross, moreover, cuts through the name Leo to show that Brother Leo is a member of the elect marked on the forehead with the sign of salvation. Tau is also mentioned in the book of Ezekiel. It is the sign of the saved, the saved who are marked on the forehead with the Tau symbol. The Tau is also the last letter of the Jewish alphabet, which is why Francis adopts it, because it is the last letter, thus expressing his choice to remain among the last ones. It is also a symbol that refers to the cross, that cross that has always marked the life of Francis. Al reverendo Padre in Cristo, frate Crescenzio, per grazia di Dio, ministro generale, frate Leone, frate Rufino e frate Angelo, che in passato furono compagni senza esserne meritevoli del beato Padre Francesco, esprimono la loro doverosa e devota riverenza nel Signore. 
after the death of St. Francis, when Crescentius da Iesi, Minister General, asked the friars for new historical information about St. Francis, Brother Leo, together with Brother Angelo and Brother Rufinus at Greccio, near Rieti, sent their memoirs, not the reports of the miracles, but the events, and above all, the words of St. Francis. Noi, che siamo vissuti più a lungo insieme con lui, benché non ne fossimo degni, abbiamo ritenuto opportuno di presentare alla santità vostra, guida la verità, alcune tra le molte gesta di lui che abbiamo visto di persona o di cui abbiamo attinto notizie da altri santi frati. Brother Leo died November the 13th, 1271. St. Francis died the evening of October the 3rd, 1226. From 1226 to 1271, one of the most credible witnesses of the Franciscan phenomenon was this brother. So much is said about St. Francis and a little less about his companions. But what would have become of St. Francis and his charism if there had been no companions? In some ancient sources, this phrase crops up repeatedly. We who were with him, we who have been with him, give testimony. In the crypt, next to St. Francis's bare stark tomb, there is Brother Angelo, a soldier. There is Brother Rufinus, a cousin of St. Clair and an aristocrat. There is Brother Maceo, a commoner. And there is Brother Leo, the confessor the scribe, St. Francis's witness. Tu sei santo, Signore solo Dio, che compi meraviglie. Tu sei forte, tu sei grande, tu sei altissimo, tu sei onnipotente. Tu, Padre Santo, Re del cielo e della terra. Tu sei trino e uno, Signore Dio degli dèi, Tu sei il bene, ogni bene, il sommo bene, Signore Dio, vivo e vero. Tu sei amore e carità, tu sei sapienza, tu sei umiltà, tu sei pazienza, tu sei bellezza, tu sei sicurezza, tu sei quiete. <totipo> 